Hey, it's Andrew here at BTL Range in Conroe, Texas again. Today on the bench we have um, a little rifle that we're starting, well, we've seen quite a bit of these on the used market throughout the years. Uh, they're kind of a sleeper on the used gun market, at least down here in Texas. This is a BSA, Birmingham Small Arms, English-made sporting rifle from the 60s, the 1960s. Um, England uh, has made commercial sporting arms uh, for quite a while. Obviously, the shotguns, best quality shotguns, Purdy and, and uh, Holland Holland and, and quite a few of those, and, and Rigby's and rifles and shotguns. But uh, Parker Hale and then Birmingham Small Arms also made quite a few models, uh, typically for the American market beginning in the 50s and, and this is one of those BSA products. So let's uh, take a minute to explore some of the history of the Birmingham, Birmingham Small Arms, which is primarily a military ordnance company, uh, but branched out into so many different things throughout its, uh, throughout its existence and kind of where they are now. And we'll look at this particular rifle and uh, some of the unique aspects of, of this gun. So BSA, Birmingham Small Arms, uh, came into being uh, about 1861 in Birmingham uh, in England. I guess if, if you're here in Alabama, it's Birmingham, but over there it's Birmingham, uh, in the gun quarter. And, and they started literally in the 17th century uh, getting gun makers together. And then in 1861, they formed uh, Birmingham Small Arms, and they actually got some U.S. Uh, made machinery so they could begin making uh, guns using machine tools so that the guns would have interchangeable parts. It was kind of a, a new uh, kind of a new thing for them uh, trying to modernize uh, their their factory and modernizing the way they were producing guns. The War Department in England actually provided them with some drawings from the uh, small arms factory at Enfield. So they, they had begun to get some War Department backing and the War Department in England uh, had promised them, oh, a number of different contracts. And, and as you can see, as we'll talk about here in just a second, uh, the War Department really uh, didn't hold up their end of the bargain with Birmingham Small Arms and, and caused them some difficulty over the years. They didn't really get a contract until 1868, uh, some seven years later. So, uh, and in fact, even uh, in 1879, after that initial contract for some Turkish rifles, uh, rifles going to Turkey had gone through, they, they even closed their factory for a year because of, there weren't any contracts. So um, in 1880, they started making bicycles. Um, in 1905, they did their first experimental motorcycle. So yes, BSA motorcycles, BSA bicycles, the same Birmingham small arms that made the rifles. And then in 1887, they finally started producing the uh, Lee Enfield uh, rifle and began their military production at that point and continued until World War I. Uh, of course, uh, World War I, they were producing Lewis guns. They were producing uh, the SMLE rifles, ammunition, bicycles for the war effort, motorcycles for the war effort. They even had a subsidiary uh, called Daimler that was producing aircraft engine and aircraft parts. They, they really uh, expanded into a lot more than small arms for sure. Uh, and that Daimler um, name stayed for, for quite a long time. They were producing cars well into the 20th century. So um, the war office continued to make promises they didn't keep. And so Birmingham Small Arms was uh, in financial difficulty more than they were solvent for many, many years. So uh, by the late 30s, uh, BSA was the only factory in England that was producing rifles. So when World War II kick, uh, kicked off uh, for England, they really looked uh, to BSA to step up and they had all this machinery and storage from World War I, so they uncrated all that stuff and started producing rifles again until uh, the other small arms factories uh, at, at Enfield and for Zerkeley could start back up again. So uh, through the World War, World War II, obviously they were producing the, uh, the war material 
uh, just like they were in World War I. But after World War II ended, just like everywhere else in the world, uh, the military small arms makers uh, really finding it hard to, to make ends meet. There just wasn't any demand, weren't any orders coming in for stuff, really. So they turned to commercial production. So by the mid-50s, they were producing uh, bolt-action rifles for the hunting market. And, and they were produced with a variety of different uh, model names, such as Royal, Majestic, uh, Majestic Deluxe, Monarch, Monarch Deluxe. And the difficult part for us now uh, is that they didn't mark that on the guns. They didn't mark the models on the guns. So you have to look at what the features are to determine which model BSA you have, because there were some design changes. So the first one was the Royal, the, B, uh, the BSA Royal, which was a 98 Mauser-style gun, had the Mauser-style claw extractor controlled round feed gun. And uh, on the top of the gun, the scope bases were dovetailed specifically for uh, some Parker Hale uh, mounts and rings, and, and that was uh, the BSA Royal, and it was in all the typical calibers you would find from 57 to 59 is when that gun was produced, so you would have 30 out 6 and 308 and 243 and things of that nature, and they had three different action links in that rifle. So uh, after 59, uh, they changed to uh, a, a rifle called the Majestic, which was a push feed gun, still had the Parker Hale mounts on the top. And then the Monarch, and the Monarch was a 60s gun, uh, started I think 66-ish. And uh, it was a simplified gun, they did away with that Parker Hale mount, and this gun is a Monarch. They did away with the Parker Hale mount, and drilled and tapped it on the top uh, the good news is the top of this receiver is Remington 700 scope pattern, so uh, you'll need to use two-piece bases, however. The, the, the distance here is different than a 700, but the, the individual hole spacing on the rings are the same. So you, whether you use Weaver-style bases or whatever-style bases for the uh, Remington 700, two-piece bases will work on these BSA drilled and tapped guns. And then the later guns, um, was a CF2. Uh, the CF2 started showing up in the 70s, and that's the one you probably see most often today. But let, let's take a look at this Monarch here. Um, so before we start manipulating it, obviously we're going to check and see that it's clear. We're going to run our finger in here. Yep, we're clear. So we have a, a pretty standard bolt action uh, push feed gun. So to remove the bolt from this gun so we can take a look at it, it's kind of unique. You would pull the bolt back to the halfway mark, you reach in, pull this trigger forward, and bring it out. So I've seen a lot of people struggle with this gun, looking number one, looking for a bolt catch, there's not one. Or they try to pull that trigger all the way to the rear and remove the bolt backwards, and um, it doesn't work. You have to actually push the trigger forward to clear the bolt out. So. Uh, the bolts are serialized to the gun, so if you're evaluating one of these guns to purchase, uh, check for this serial number here to match the serial number that's on the side of the receiver. So a way to tell this gun apart from the later gun, the CF2, is the bolt shroud. This has a pretty steep taper on the bolt shroud here, and it's serrated right here. The CF2 has a longer bolt shroud, comes out to about here. It's a more gradual taper. So that's one of the, the immediate visual clues to determine a CF2 from the Monarch. The other visual clue that you can tell from across the room is this spacer, this uh, four-end tip right here. On the CF2, it, it is chevroned. It has uh, like a chevron here instead of a straight angled uh, white line spacer there. So from across the room, those are two easy ways to determine which rifle you have. Another unique little feature about the BSA guns is the way they did the extractor. So uh, as we said, the Royal guns uh, had a Mauser style extractor, so you had a long claw and a collar here, like on a Mauser 98. But on, on this rifle, we have a uh, extractor here as a part of the bolt face that's held in place by a spring-loaded plunger, this guy right here. So uh, that's kind of a unique feature 
that we see on the uh, on the BSA guns, and we have a typical plunger style ejector. It's a pretty robust system as far as extractors go. It's probably superior to the Remington 700 style uh, clipped into the bolt face type uh, extractor. Uh, it's a really robust action. It's it's fully capable of this gun, particular gun, seven magnum, but uh, they made them all the way up through 458 Win Mag, so. There's, uh, there's no reason to be worried about action strength on the BSA guns. They're, they're all forged steel. They're all, uh, it's a really high quality action. Now that said, there was another company called Herders, H-E-R-T-E-R-S, Herders, a mail order uh, catalog store from the 50s and 60s that had BSA produce actions for them and they marketed them as the Herders U9. And herders were assembling those guns uh, in the United States. They were barreling them in the United States, or they, they may have gotten some barreled action uh, straight from BSA. But um, those guns vary, the herders' guns vary widely in quality. So those individual guns probably should, really should have a gunsmith check it out before you get too deep into it. So another little thing about the, uh, the Monarch versus the CF2 is the way the trigger guard uh, is attached. So the trigger guard on the CF2, or on the Monarch rather, uh, this gun, is uh, this is a separate piece from, from the, the floor plate and this piece here. And it's held in, there's a screw here obviously, but the second screw, actually you have to pull these two screws, the barreled action comes off, and then there's a screw that comes down from the inside that secures the front of this trigger bow. So that, that has to be removed after the barreled action comes out of the stock. And on the CF2, the later gun, this is all a one-piece unit similar to a Remington 700. So the triggers on these guys are adjustable for weight of pull. There's a small uh, set screw right here in the front of the trigger. It can be adjusted without the uh, gun being disassembled. Not a particularly crisp trigger, but it's an okay trigger. There's a nice uh, little rocking safety right here on the side uh, of the uh, of the action. Now, on the early gun on the on the Royal, the uh, safety was on the back of the bolt shroud. Again, similar to where you would see a 98 or a, or a Winchester 70. So, uh, a little bit different gun. Uh, but a little bit harder to scope because you remember it had the integral Parker Hale style, style mounts on the top for, for that particular gun. All of these BSA guns, uh, with some exceptions of the later CF2 models, were equipped with open sights. These are just uh, typical folding leaf, uh, little William style rear sight if, and, the, and the ramp front sight there. I don't know that anyone is really using a 7 Magnum uh, with a with a, with rifle sights with open sights anymore, but uh, if you are, good good for you. Uh, I can't see well enough to make any headway with it anymore for sure. The floor plate is releasable by the uh, little uh, catch here in the front of the trigger guard and it just clicks back into place. So the rifle can be unloaded out of the bottom uh, instead of having to work them through the action. So uh, that's always a, a good plan. Now all of these, all of these Hurt, I'm not herders. All of these BSA guns originally had gloss finish stocks. So someone has uh, sanded this, knocked this finish down. You can see they've really uh, sanded some of this checkering. There was a checkering panel on either side of these, uh, on either side of the pistol grip. So that's been obviously altered and changed, and this oil finish has put, been put back on. So. They had some uh, small checkering pad on either side. This this uh, pistol grip has a palm swell on the right side. That was from the factory. So this is a factory stock that has been, uh, the finish has been removed and then it will finish put back on. Uh, one of the problems with the BSA guns is that the finish degraded, the, the lacquer finish that they used, or polyurethane, I'm not sure which, which it was, that they used over time would tend to start flaking. So they got kind of, uh, they, they didn't look that great, you know, with, with some wear. So a lot of people have refinished those stocks. So that said, uh, makes a good brother-in-law gun. And, and what I mean by that is when your brother-in-law shows up 
to go deer hunting at the last second and doesn't have a rifle because he's not a hunter or a shooter or whatever the problem is. You've got a throwdown rifle that uh, you're not afraid of him dragging across, you know, uh, falling out of the back of the pickup truck or whatever happens, whatever happens to brother-in-law. I've had three wives, none of whom have brothers, so I've never had to deal with the, the brother-in-law problem. Uh, plenty of other problems associated with three wives, I'll tell you that, but that's, that's a story uh, for another day for sure. So what's happened with BSA since then? Uh, in 1986, a Spanish company called Gamo, G-A-M-O, purchased uh, BSA, uh, purchased the rights to the name and the, and the, uh, the logo, which is a stack, three stacked rifles. And uh, they purchased uh, all of it. And they, the sporting rifles went away. The centerfire rifles went away, and BSA Guns is now an air gun company owned by Gamo. And they, they still produce air guns in the UK, in Birmingham, uh, but for Gamo. So it's a, it's a line owned by Gamo. And there's also an optics line uh, of kind of low-cost optics that are okay. Uh, the BSA Sweet 17, BSA uh, 22 scopes, and cat's eye scopes, and um, they're Taiwanese, or they're, they're Asian scopes. So... Uh, for the money, they're they're a good scope. I'm a bit of a scope snob, and I freely admit that. So, uh, if you want a, a sub two hundred dollar scope, it's not a bad not a bad place to go for a rifle scope for sure. So, uh, BSA Optics that started in 1996. So, uh, and if you look at their website, BSA Optics, you know, uh, tries to lay claim to some of that Birmingham small arms history, and it's not really pertinent. To, to what they do, and it's, it's kind of irritating because uh, you know, Birmingham Small Arms has nothing to do with BSA optics of today, but that's not unusual in the gun business. Hell, Springfield Armory does that now. So does Henry Repeating Arms. They have nothing to do with the original firearms manufacturers under those names. But anyway, that's, that's a rant that I could go on for quite a while. So how do we evaluate one of these rifles? What are we looking for? What are some of the problems? So we go back to uh, the things we always look at is, you know, the originality of the gun, uh, the condition of the gun, the scarcity of the gun. So uh, the scarcity of the gun, they're, they're uncommon, but they're not scarce. They were, they were exported, they were produced, and specifically for export to the United States, we see this rollover cheek piece here. And if we were in the original high gloss uh, version of this gun, you would see that it was very definitely wanted to be styled after a Weatherby, even to the point of, of inlaying this white diamond in the in the rosewood pistol grip cap. So you can see they were trying to to uh, build off of the Weatherby style, which was so popular in the 60s and the 70s. So uh, they're not particularly scarce. Uh, you will see them in in gun shops that sell used guns. You will see them in pawn shops, things of that nature. And for a really uh, attractive price, typically, because they, they, don't, they don't command a lot of money. There's uh, a very limited collector interest in these guns, particularly in the later guns. Now, the earlier push feed guns, 57 through 59, the Royal, some, some folks uh, called it the Hunter version. And these were imported by our, uh, we've talked about them before, Galef, G-A-L-E-F. Uh, was a large importer during that time, and they imported the BSA guns. And there were some smaller importers. This particular rifle, um, late 60s gun, would, would have been imported, or was imported by a company called Eagle Arms. Uh, so it's not a Galef gun, but most of them were uh, by J.L. Galef. And um, with all the hype and, and advertising her hyperbole, but they're just not heavily collected now, except for that early gun. So you can find these guns at a really attractive price, uh, well, so, sub 500 bucks easily, uh, in just about whatever caliber you can find them in. 30 out 6 obviously being the most common, uh, 7 mag, 300 mag. And at that kind of money, they represent a really solid value as a shooter. So, um, Two ways to look at it. If you're going for a collectible uh, BSA, then you would need to really search out one of those two-year, two or three-year production guns with the control round feed Mauser 98 style action uh, if you can live with that Parker Hell Scope mount. If you're looking for a shooter, you're going to move down to the, uh, to the Majestic um, 
I'm sorry, not the Majestic, that still had the Parker Hill, but the Monarch and the CF2, uh, which were drilled and tapped and will accept Remington 700 style mount. So the actions are different. There's some differences in the trigger and the way the actions are put together, but they still represent a great value. So uh, scarcity, not all that scarce, depending on which model you're talking about. So the originality of the gun, this gun obviously, uh, the stock, uh, the what's been done to the stock, has really taken away any collector interest there would be on the gun, and it's strictly as, it strictly would be valued as a shooter. So the can then we look at the condition of the gun. So the uh, stock's not cracked, the pad's still good. We don't have any chips out of the toe. Uh, that's all good news. The gun's functional, and the bore's great. On any of these British small arms, these BSA guns, pay attention to the bore of the rifle. Um, some. Some of the bores uh, on a lot of, uh, well, there have been, and you read about it in forums, uh, there are some anecdotal instances of, of guns shooting out uh, or the barrels getting shot out uh, with a relatively low round count. I've, I've not known that to be the case uh, personally, I've, but I've really only handled or dealt with just a relatively small amount of these rifles. So uh, just use the bore light, take a look at the bore, make sure your rifling's good and strong and uh, obviously not pitted or anything like that. So, and then uh, check the, just a standard function check. But other than that, uh, what you're buying when you buy one of these uh, push feed uh, BSA guns is a shooter grade gun that you're not gonna be a safe queen. You're not gonna be afraid to take it out and drag it through the South Texas brush or wherever you're hunting at. Um, and still be a, a nice, remarkable minute to minute and a half angle, one to one and a half inches at a hundred yard rifle is uh, what you can expect out of this gun. So uh, it's, can, it's beginning to be problematic uh, to find parts. That's, that's the only other issue with these rifles is finding parts for them. They're not being remade anywhere by anybody. So any parts that exist out there are from cannibalized rifles. Uh, and we've talked about that before. I'm not a huge fan of that uh, because the part you're getting in the mail may be no better than the part that you're trying to replace. But uh, if that's the only part you can get, it's the only part you can get, right? It may be better than, uh, you know, a broken firing pin, for instance. So anyway, Birmingham Small Arms, um, just a little cultural reference to that. Uh, if you were a fan of the show Peaky Blinders, uh, and I watched it, uh, watched that all the way through all of its seasons. Um, there was a little subplot involving a burglary, and that, that actually happened, where there was a, uh, a burglary of the BSA plant there in a small heath in Birmingham, uh, where rifles and Lewis machine guns were taken. So there's a little bit of tie-in there, a little bit of a entertainment tie-in with, uh, with the Birmingham small arms plant. So. This is a BSA Monarch um, from the 1960s in 7 mag. Uh, if you like what we're doing, uh, hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, let us know. Uh, make sure you comment. We read all those comments and, and respond. And we appreciate all the support you give in the channel. We'll see you next time.